Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining Data Arts webinar series. Uh, today's topic is cloud security, how to succeed with infrastructure hardening. It's great to have you all. I'm your host. My name is Neil Smullyan, and I'm Vice President of Business Development here at Data Art. So once again, thank you all for joining. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dmitry, Dmitry Voroskov, Senior Security Consultant, and Yaroslav Voronstov, Senior Solution Architect, who will be giving today's presentation. Thank you all so much. We hope you enjoy. Gentlemen. Okay, thank you, Neil, for introduction. Okay, I, I will correct you a bit because I'm senior security consultant and Dmitry is chief software architect. Okay, and here is the agenda for our today's webinar. First of all, we are going to review some fundamental security concepts uh, in order to understand how they implement it in the clouds. Uh, then we will focus on um, key differences between cloud and on-premises security models. After that, we will make our first steps in cloud hardening and investigate how to automate security and compliance checks and even protect some, some important cloud resources. Finally, we're going to touch some aspects of operational security too. But before we dive into the cloud security topic, I'd like to give you a quick overview of some fundamental concepts which we are going to use throughout this webinar. You know that information security is all about data confidentiality, integrity and availability, but there are some important extras which should be kept in mind. The first is the principle of least privilege. It's the fundamental idea that any principle, whether it's a user, a program, or a process, should have only the bare minimum of privileges necessary to perform its function. Uh, for example, a user account, uh, which was created for pulling records from a database, doesn't need admin rights. While a programmer's, uh, a programmer's duty is to write code and not to access the financial records of a company. The next concept is separation of roles. It's also known as segregation of duties. It's about having more than one person required to complete a complex task. Uh, they need to know restrictions. A person would not be given access to certain information unless that access is mandatory for that person to conduct his or her official duties. Such a principle also discourages viewing sensitive material by limiting access to the smallest possible number of people. And two more popular concepts. Perimeter protection is a set of barriers, uh, which are usually network-based, to keep intruders and unauthorized principles out from a secure area or zone. It's like you're building a fence which declares that here's your territory and it's forbidden to trespass it. Finally, security or defense in depth, also known as castle approach. It's a concept in which multiple defensive layers are used in an IT system to provide redundancy and defend against attacks using several independent methods. One may have a question, how does security affect a business? What are the immediate actions to take and what could be postponed? Previously, Data Art prepared a slide deck which describes the multi level approach to enterprise security and build uh, its own kind of Maslow's pyramid. This pyramid should give you the idea of how fundamental security principles could be implemented on various levels of enterprise security. The full version of the deck is accessible via the link displayed in the bottom right corner. So, if you're interested, you could click on it after the webinar. We are going to cover the, the bottom four levels of this pyramid starting from the zero and so we will touch a bit a, a level number four uh, as they mostly cover technical controls and basic approaches intended to reduce uh, data exposure risks for clouds. The top ones uh, are focused on operational security and organization level measures and they require a separate major discussion. Uh, before we start, I just want to emphasize the importance of the ground level, as cloud resources are important assets and should be included into a company's asset management activities. So let's assume that you've just migrated your applications, services, and data storages from a data center to a cloud. You've set up a firewall with IP listing and probably a VPN access point. You've also heard that cloud setups are generally safer than classic on-premises. So you probably think that your assets would be in safety by default. Is that true? 
Well, let's check and find out the answer. And surprisingly, the answer is no, it's not enough to have the bare minimum of perimeter protection because keeping the cloud resources safe is a joint effort between you, the cloud customer, and the cloud provider. It's also essential to know the type of your cloud. It could be infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, or a hybrid setup with elements of all three types. Customer responsibilities are usually determined based on the type of the deployment. And the rule of thumb says that your responsibility grows when you use lower level of abstraction. The diagram, which is located on the slide, shows the areas of responsibility of a cloud provider and a cloud customer. It also highlights the key difference between the on-premises and cloud security. You're operating under shared responsibility model, where cloud service providers are responsible for the security of the cloud itself, and the customers are responsible for securing the data they put into the cloud. Half-colored circles could be treated as areas where a provider gives you a set of security instruments, but it's a customer duty to configure them properly in order to protect their data. Well, it's worth mentioning that all major cloud market players provide all types of cloud services, infrastructure, platform, and software as a service. Uh, we checked more than 30 cloud accounts last year and observed that environments are often a mixture of services. For example, you could use infrastructure as a service for your computing nodes. They could be virtual machines, uh, platform as a service for data storage. It could be a managed SQL or no SQL database and software as a service for uh, CM or centralized logging. That's why a typical cloud audit or hardening should use security in depth principle and focus on multiple levels of security controls. So we reach to the first key point of our talk. What are your duties in typical hybrid configuration? Let's list them briefly. A cloud provider is usually responsible for the physical security for the software, hardware, buildings, servers, hypervisor configurations, and managed services, as well as for personal screening. You, as a cloud customer, you, um, perform digital identity management. You determine which employees should have access to the cloud. You, are, you configure services in a secure manner, which is in line with your organization's security policy. You prevent uploads of sensitive data and you should be able to detect and prevent security breaches. But there is something more. There is a group of responsibilities which are shared between the provider and the customer. They could be either provided as dedicated cloud services or partially implemented, while the other part, the enforcement of security rules, should be defined by a client. Here are they. It's enforcing compliance with external regulations, vulnerability management, applying security patches, updating operating systems and software, ensuring network security, and building mature business continuity and disaster recovery strategies. Okay, as I mentioned before, let's assume that you've just migrated to a cloud, or you are probably building a brand new product and planning to use either AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud Platform. What will your starting point be? And how to start hardening your virtual infrastructure? So before we disclose the first point on the slide, we should probably review how clouds changed over the time. Uh, two things happened in the past. The first is that both the community and the vendors started collecting the best practices and dozens of reference architectures. Then infrastructure as code approach appeared and became popular. So a deployment became as simple as running several commands in a shell. At some point in the past, uh, infrastructure as code and best practices met somewhere in a place called blueprints. So. Blueprints define a reference architecture or a repeatable set of cloud resources, which are intended to speed up uh, the creation of new environments and, of course, save the costs. Those blueprints are provided by vendors and by communities, as you can see on the slide. 
most of them have a uh, most of those blueprints have a few billion security guard guardrails which could be altered or even extended to adhere to an organization security policy or address range of requirements from external regulators. Probably blueprints are the best starting point for both cloud natives, those who build infrastructure from the scratch and for cloud migrants, those who have just moved from on-premises or are planning to do that. The second step is the inventor of tools and your resources. Uh, you could do it in an old school way by making an Excel file with all resource ID and so on, but it's much simpler to automate also discovery, tracking and management by using tools like AWS Config, Azure Resource Manager and Monitor, and uh, GCP's Cloud Asset Inventory. They provide you with a, uh, with a uh, dashboard, which shows all the resources within the cloud and uh, uh, demonstrate the compliance and health state. Each new resource will be added here automatically. So there will be no more boring inventory login exercises. And the third step. Do you remember the step number one of the pyramid? Well, it was about the security defaults. Even though it's 2020 now and many vendors are really doing their best to provide hardened by default setups, there are still lots of default settings which might significantly affect your data security. Their credentials, weak password policies, legacy authentication methods, non-secure communication channels, publicly available admin page, and many other misconfigs. You know such dark corners of your infrastructure much better. So it's time to start making them brighter right now. Just to recap, the algorithm is simple. Prepare and deploy a blueprint, build an inventory of cloud resources, and change the most obvious security defaults. Once you've completed those three basic exercises, it's time to move to something advanced and check yourself against industry best practices. These materials are very popular among third-party auditors, and they are usually built into various auditing tools, which we will discuss a bit later. Here they are. The first is the set of CIS benchmarks for AWS, Azure, and GCP. The second are uh, rules of trend micro conformity knowledge base. It's also known as cloud conformity knowledge base for AWS and Azure. They also promised to release GCP or conformity rules quite soon. And the third are the security remediation guides from Cloud Exploit located on GitHub. Um, CIS also provides several operating system technology vendor or tool specific materials for hardening, for example, Docker, Kubernetes, Ease, Nginx, Apache setups. And there are also some uh, good uh, security white papers from Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. All items in these benchmarks have detailed steps on uh, remediating the issues and on finding them. So you just need to print out a list of questions, select the most critical cloud account, and start the first round. Probably after the first run, it's highly likely that you'll be confused and upset by these long lists of boring bullets marked as non-compliant. But don't panic and keep calm. Everyone was at this point sometime before. And I'd like to congratulate you because you've made your second major step to an ultimate cloud security. At this point, you may think that all those items from the checklist should be checked, should be verified manually. Fortunately not, because there are lots of various tools on the market and some of them are free. Here is a brief overview of how to automate cloud compliance checks. There are many free cloud auditing tools which are based on CIS benchmarks. They are listed in the first column. The first three of them, namely Cloud Security Suite, Cloud Scout Suite, and Cloud Exploit, are multi cloud and provide rich reports for each of the three major cloud providers. Uh, the uh, rest of the tools are cloud specific and could be useful when you have a homogeneous setup. Containers, which are trained right now, require special attention to. There are a number of instruments which help in finding overly privileged setups and a few more which perform vulnerability scanning like Claire. 
But the third column is the most interesting one because it shows a set of tools which help in early bug hunting. You know that the modern approach to infrastructure is infrastructure as code. And the uh, trend of ID security is shift left. What does it mean? We are just shifting the security checks to the early stages of our software development life cycles and CI CD pipelines. So we could enforce static analysis for configuration files, which are used to deploy clouds and cloud services, because it's much easier to spot all misconfigs early when they are not deployed yet and exist only in the configuration files. Let me uh, show you how cloud audit reports look like. So the former uh, picture is for Scout Suite. Uh, it's a set of interactive HTML pages, which shows you the, um, the misconfigurations in your cloud accounts. The latter is the old school console output from Prowler. Well, it looks interesting. I think you agree with that. But how to hunt issues immediately and do not perform uh, repeated audits repeatedly? The answer is cloud compliance checks could be continuous. All three major players have building services with multiple profiles for monitoring. And these profiles are usually based on well-known industry standards like ISO family, PCI DSS, HIPAA or GDPR. And these tools could help in identifying pain points in a few minutes. Uh, how it looks like. If something is not compliant with the predefined rules, uh, for example, you forgot to close SSH access to your Linux virtual machines, you will get a notification immediately. If you have a multi-cloud setup, uh, it's worth looking at universal third-party tools, which could handle multiple cloud accounts simultaneously and show their security grade in a single dashboard. They are Prisma Public Cloud, Trend Micro Cloud One, Cloud Checker, and uh, Cloud Monitors from Polis. So it's time for Dmitry to tell you about specific cloud hardening exercises. I'm giving the present rights to him. Dmitry. Thank you, Yaroslav. Um, so Yaroslav gave you great links to resources um, that have lists of recommendations and suggested checks. So I believe you now have understanding where to go for wisdom. So there are tools that would give you real-time indication of your security posture within the cloud, and I really encourage you to try them out. Uh, still, my experience shows that companies tend to leave everything as is, uh, using insecure defaults, focusing more on the business goals rather than uh, doing security hardening, at least during the initial stages of cloud adaptation. So my role on this webinar would be to give you several very simple advices, practical advices on what you need to do to raise your security level to at least somewhat basic. If you uh, find that you already implemented all these controls, then you're great. You can proceed with more advanced checks using this benchmark as Yaroslav recommended. Otherwise, I'll be glad to give you um, something that you could improve right now. So let's start from account basics. The first advice, is to isolate development and production environments into two different accounts. Development accounts are subject to experiments, often with disabled security checks. Moreover, you simply have more people with access to it, and as a result, more risk of unauthorized access. So in case it is compromised, you must not affect your production system. Uh, next, make sure to fill valid security contacts, secondary contacts, and answer to security questions uh, in your cloud account. Many people forgot to do it. That will allow you to regain access to the, kind, to the account in the event of compromise. Also, you may be notified by your cloud vendor during security incidents. For AWS, there is a feature called Detailed Billing that will help you to see line by line billing items and make sure that you are not paying for anything unexpected. Enable security dashboards. There are different tools for different clouds and support tires, but generally they will show you some recommendations on security hardening. For AWS, it's trusted uh, for Security Hub, for Azure Security Center, and for Google Cloud, this is Security Common Center. Okay, let's now speak about identity and access management. It's one of the important areas uh, that you should secure regardless of, the, of which cloud you use. 
and build services you pick within this cloud infrastructure, platform, or software as a service. Many researchers believe that security perimeter of a company has been shifted from network isolation and classic firewalls to identity and access management. You might ask, why is it so? Well, network perimeters keep getting more porous and network defenses are not effective as they were before the explosion of bring your own device policies and cloud applications. Even further, consider current trend of work from home. In many cases, identity and access management is really the only obstacle that prevents getting access to your company's data and resources. Speaking about identity and access management in cloud environments, it's basically a service that helps you securely control who can access your cloud resources. Subjects or principles of the IAM, your employees who manage the cloud, or more often, uh, it's uh, services that run within or outside the cloud, and they need to access uh, data and resources within your cloud. IAM policies define which principles can access which resources within the cloud. So how to secure IAM? Um, so first advice is very simple, stop using root user and remove any keys that belong to it. Next one, make sure to configure strong password policy for interactive logins. Current recommendations by cloud vendors is to use passwords with at least 14 characters long. Enforce MFA. It has to be enabled for all users with access to the cloud console. It's very easy to use soft tokens, which are applications such as Google Authenticator on your mobile device that generate your temporary codes every 30 seconds and give you a second factor. Alternatively, you could use hardware tokens such as RSI Secure ID. Use principle of least privilege. As Yaroslav mentioned, this is basic security principle. Do not give overly permissive access to your employees. The same practice should apply when you give permissions to your cloud workers or applications services. Do not hard code access keys or other credentials to your cloud applications. All clouds have mechanism to allow your applications to get temporary access keys based on assigned role. Use that feature and make sure the application receives only those permissions that it needs. Take a habit of disabling connective credentials. Anything not used 90 days, just disable it. It's easy to write a Lambda or implement the kind of user lifecycle management to take care of user provisioning, maintenance, and deprovisioning. Make sure to rotate credentials, especially those that could be exposed in various places. For example, access keys used for remote access to the cloud resources are very good candidates for that. While these recommendations seem like a standard set of practices from legacy enterprise policy, well, mostly they are. So it makes us wonder why we report about these issues over and over again during our security audits. Okay, let's get us to something more interesting. Sometimes clients ask us to do forensics after a security breach. Once we are given access to the cloud environment, we often notice the environment has no or very little logs that couldn't really help us in our investigation. I wonder what could be the reason of not enabling all kind of possible audit logging within the cloud environment. Fortunately, it's just a bunch of clicks you need to do or just a few lines of code that you need to write. Trust me, audit logging really helps a lot during security incident investigation or even in cases when you need to understand what happened to a working environment that doesn't work right now. So what you need to do? So first, make sure that cloud audit log is enabled globally. Each cloud has several types of logging. First type is cloud logs. They track changes made to your resources, such as adding new VMs, changing resource settings and policies, and so on. The second type is access logs. They track requests made to your resources, such as reading files from S3 buckets, calling web APIs, and so on. Make sure that both are enabled in all regions globally. And if you have multiple cloud accounts, it makes much sense to create another account with restricted access where you would store all logs. So logs will transfer across accounts. Next, protect your security events. Integrity, completeness, and availability of these logs is crucial for forensics and auditing purposes. So you need to enable log encryption, integrity check mechanism, and MFI delete. Also configure access policy to make sure only trusted staff can access these logs. Very important to enable alerts to suspicious events. Otherwise, you may never notice that something bad is happening to your account. Examples of events you should trigger alerts are 
on the screen. Use of root user, IAM policy changes, audit log rule changes, changes in security groups, and anything else that you may consider important. Last but not least, uh, make sure to stream logs to an external CM tool, or at least to a long-term retention storage. By default, cloud, clouds may delete logs after some short period of time, so make sure this is not happening for your account. Great, we just completed an important step of hardening our IAM configuration and setting up audit controls. That means we'll be able to react on breaches or suspicious activities almost immediately after they happen. But don't you think it's much better to prevent such incidents rather than handle them post-factum? So it's time to tweak other services. Let's look how we can harden our computational resources. While the main trend of cloud computing shifted to containers and orchestration system, they're still running on bare metal servers or VMs. VMs are also used in many setups, for example, bastion hosts or a custom deployment of message queue service. And there are no reasons why VMs should not be hardened too. So hardening ideas are pretty straightforward as we're going to reduce the attack surface available to a potential mail factor. The first and most important point is that we should put all VMs into private subnets behind load balancers, net gateways, and firewalls. These are kept within the secure perimeter. Uh, so unless there are strong reasons to expose them to, pub to public. I want to emphasize once again that all hard-coded credentials for services running on VMs should be removed from configuration files. They could be stolen in uh, they could be stored in specialized secret manager tools or substitute with built-in IAM roles, as I explained previously. Otherwise, that could be stolen by a hacker or a piece of malware. All unused services should be disabled too. For example, we often see Bastion hosts or VPN server have web proxies. If such proxy is compromised, a mail factor could access the whole infrastructure through it. Lastly, it's time for something well known for those who, you, uh, who, who migrated from on-premises. Running vulnerability scans, executing our specific benchmarks to determine and plan next hardening actions. So let's discuss container hardening now. The first point is that um, usage of root accounts. Just do not do it unless you really need root privilege inside the container. Extra capabilities like network administration or overriding the file system permissions are usually not needed for containers with, for example, web application. So it's worth disabling them too. The reasons behind are very simple. Docker Daemon works on the privileged account. So if a mail factor succeeds in compromising your web application which runs within the container, he or she could use Docker vulnerabilities and misconfigurations to take control over the host system and then to other containers. That's why it's also mandatory to close admin access to orchestration APIs and enforce role-based access control for Kubernetes cluster. Base images of your software require attention too. They should be stored in private registries, otherwise someone could access such a public registry, download the image, and perform reverse engineering of your application. If it's Java, for example, or .NET applications, you're likely to lose your IP too. The last but not least is vulnerability scanning of these base images. Containers and productions are typically immutable, so it's sufficient to monitor what happens with the respective images. If there is a flaw, such a system will notify you of that and suggest remediation steps. So at this point, you may say that we forgot about serverless, which is handy in some cases. Yes, all your lambdas require some hardening effort too. And we're using the same technique, trying to reduce attack surface. So what we could do? Serverless resources should not be exposed to internet directly. All cloud vendors provide special tools like API gateways, which hide the implementation details and add security layer on top of your Lambda. Another thing is to remember to make sure that um, you have one-to-one -one relationship between Lambda function and corresponding IAM role. This is to avoid accidental elevation of privilege when the same role is shared by multiple functions. And it's necessary to grant permissions, extra permissions to one function only. So if your role is shared, then all functions will receive that extra permission, which they do not require, require for proper function. Um, serverless resources also integrated with cloud audit system. So you just need to ensure that data collection is enabled and data ingestion is on. So quite a few steps as you see. 
Another important piece of infrastructure is virtual networks. Hardening principles of virtual networks are very similar to hardening of classic on-premise networks. You just need to segregate your virtual private clouds into multiple segments based on your business purpose and data classification. And then you set restrictive ingress and egress access rules. Avoid usage of default security groups as they are usually too permissive. Um, you should also think of configuring end-to-end -end encryption because within the cloud, the traffic is typically flows in an encrypted form between the endpoints. So in this case, if a VM or piece of infrastructure is compromised, mail factor would be able to perform packet sniffing or active network intrusion. Probably it's also the reason for installing next generation firewall appliances. If it's mandated, for example, by a company security policies, you will monitor the traffic and try catching the security threats before they reach actual computation resources. Okay, now we are going to see how we can protect databases and other kind of data storage. It's not su surprising that many major data leaks that happened during past years were caused by weak configuration of data storages. For example, you may remember Marriott, Capital One, or other famous hacks. The main threat which is associated with any type of data storage is an intended data leakage, either at rest or while in transit. That's why it's necessary to check a uh, few things. First of them, make sure to have deny public access. Um, so you need to make sure that unrestricted access is disabled, as well as you need to check that um, you enforce secure connections such as TLS. It's also recommended to enable transparent data encryption to protect data at rest. While setting data encryption, do not forget to apply it to all backups and snapshots. If possible, use your bring your own key material. The reason behind having Bioc is simple. It provides additional level of access control since you could set up restriction on key usage too. Otherwise, these keys are managed by the platform, so they won't prevent a malicious employee accessing confidential data. And of course, do not forget to configure extended logging and origin. Great, let's now review a few other services and settings which we recommend paying attention to. The first is proper use of cryptography when securing data in transit to your public endpoints within the cloud. Most cloud providers give you a predefined set of TLS cipher suites, which are united into TLS policies. It's important to ensure that you are using the strictest TLS policy available. By default, clouds allow you potentially weak protocols and ciphers, such as TLS 1.0. Nowadays, it's not enough to protect networks and classic firewalls with classic firewalls because of various application level attacks, such as cross site scripting, SQL injection, cross site request forgery, and other. Eventually, you should protect your applications from those, and there are several, there are sorry, special types of firewalls intended for that. They are known as L7 firewalls, Layer 7 firewalls, or web application firewalls. Uh, they installed be behind TLS of loading nodes and they analyze traffic from the internet to your applications and reject potentially malicious input. It's also important to protect from malicious network-based activities such as floods or DDoS attacks. Clouds won't protect from DDoS by default, so your application could be brought down by a classic DDoS attack. The third point is secure remote access to the cloud networks. It's essential to set up secure administrative interfaces and make them available for people who need access to cloud for administrative purposes. I'm not going to cover available techniques uh, to provide secure remote access, but I would recommend just making sure to use secure connections such as VPN, use IP whitelisting where it's possible, as well as configure access control and audit logs to connections. Most companies use content delivery network tools like Azure CDN or AWS CloudFront. They also provide access login and TLS policies. Do not forget about them. They are off by default. Some organizations prefer using domain management tools from cloud vendors. Do not forget to enable DNS query login and forbid domain transfers, for example. Otherwise, attacker could enumerate all your domain names and use that information in their future attacks. Okay, and the final point is key and secret management service that provided by AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. 
They will help you to manage your key material that you upload to the cloud and help you to establish, for example, automatic rotation of keys according to predefined schedule. So I hope this was not too boring. And I'll give Yaroslav a word where he covers um, security process. Yaroslav. Yeah, thank you, Dmitry. So please remember that each of the chats Dmitry was speaking about are pretty simple. So probably it's worth spending extra five or 10 minutes once you've deployed a new infrastructure. Otherwise, you may wake up one day and realize that you're in a very unpleasant situation. All your confidential data is being sold on a dark web market. So we've almost reached our final destination, a cloud with ultimate security. However, as Bruce Schneider said, security is a process and not a product. Do you remember the very beginning of our talk where I touched the inventory management? Yes, I'm emphasizing um, that clouds should be part of internal processes like patch management, vulnerability management, and incident management. Otherwise, our long path to gather security information would be useless because we are not using it for proactive security monitoring. Just a few points on how we could enhance our operational security. The first is the high availability and reliability as it affects your business reputation. Who would use or trust a website which is usually down? Infrastructure as service and backups are your best friends in this point. Then management policies like change management, vulnerability management, and incident management help in planning your infrastructure changes, updating the software to the most recent versions, and in communicating those changes to a wider audience because it helps keeping the figures from your SLA. Incident management also defines how to communicate with the security teams from the other vendors including your cloud provided security teams. The last but not least is the usage of a CM tool, security information and event management, and creation of a security operations center to monitor the environments through, throughout the whole day and to learn new threats, change the environments to be immune to that threats. So, Probably that's all we wanted to say about successful cloud infrastructure hardening today. And thank you very much for your attention. Neil? Thank you, gentlemen. That was excellent. Once again, thank you all for attending uh, the webinar. We really appreciate it. I want to emphasize that uh, if anybody uh, is interested in, in digging a little bit deeper into their specific needs, we're happy to provide at no cost uh, you know, questions and answers, uh, you know, bouncing ideas off of us. That's what we're here for. We would, uh, we would absolutely love to uh, help you and, uh, and uh, hear out your needs. Um, and feel free to reach out to us uh, beyond that if you have any questions beyond uh, the uh, topic of this webinar. Uh, again, Yaroslav and Dimitri, thank you so much. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. We hope we see you all again, and uh, thank you for joining the webinar. Take care. Have a great day, everyone.